Our club has always been a forum for public figures, thought leaders, and decision makers to share their ideas. Here, we offer access to dynamic political, business, and public personalities. We are dedicated to encouraging debate on the issues that matter to this city, this province, and this country. The Canadian Club is one of the most important podiums anywhere in the world that a Canadian can speak to, tell Canadians what it is that they think, develop those thoughts. And so I want to thank you for that very, very much. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists today. Through our programs and events, including our youth and young leaders programs, our diversity partnerships, our joint events, and our media and social media opportunities, we offer you access to dynamic, political, social, and business figures from abroad and right here at home. The platform from which the eloquence of Canada has flowed all of that time, whether it be business, education, politics, sports, arts and culture. If someone wants to say something to Canadians about this country and about the future of this country, this is the venue you choose. Good afternoon, members and guests. My name is David Simmons. I'm president of the Canadian Club Toronto and your host for today's event. Welcome. We are very grateful to have the opportunity to hear from one of Canada's uh, one of our country's inspirational Indigenous leaders on the importance of self-determination. It's the Canadian Club's 125th season. We're very proud to host the conversations that matter to Canadians. And over the last few years, we've been relentless in pursuing diverse stories from diverse leaders that tell Canada's story in full. And so we're, we're thrilled to have our speaker here today. Our level of engagement with members and guests has increased significantly over the last few years. There was this thing that forced us to go online for a little while. Uh, the team did a good job and now we're able to welcome hundreds of more people to today's event. They're now joining us live uh, online. As you watch today's event and join us from online, you can engage with questions uh, by clicking the Submit a Question tab on your screen. You can also use hashtags to engage with us across social media. For those of you in the room, <coughs> the room, not the womb, uh, there are question cards on your table with hashtags that you can use to engage as well. The word Inuit means the people. The recent landmark Inuit Nunangat policy will promote prosperity and support community and individual well-being throughout uh, Inuit Nunangat. The focus is on achieving socioeconomic and cultural equity between Inuit people and Canadians. Mr. Uh, Nathan Obed will provide more details shortly in his remarks. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you can write your questions on the Q&A card. We have volunteers running throughout the room. They'll uh, provide them the Q&A cards on stage. Um, I want to acknowledge our sponsors as well who help us put on this event and carry these conversations. And Aniko Eagles represented by Amar Aljuni. BLGs uh, represented by a number of guests at the student table, which I'll acknowledge shortly. And we have TD represented by Scott Belton, who's an executive member of the board here at the Canadian Club. We appreciate your support, and I'd ask the room to give you a round of applause. I'd also like to welcome students joining us today from the University of Toronto and the Leadership Lab at Toronto Metropolitan University. They're sitting here in the front. Uh, welcome them, please, guests and members. Now let me introduce our speaker. Uh, Nathan is the president of uh, the Inuit uh, Taparit Kanatami, or ITK, the national represent representational organization for the 6,000 Inuit people uh, in the 60,000 Inuit people. I, am, I mentioned earlier to the online guests who are joining us, I'm uh, learning a new language today, and Nathan has been very generous in helping me learn this new language. I'm going to make mistakes, which is part of our process. For someone who communicates for a living, I'm particularly nervous today. And it feels good to be nervous, you know? Sweating a little bit. Um, so it's not six, it's 60, and growing. Uh, Nathan was first elected seven years ago and was acclaimed to his third consecutive term last year. He grew up in Nain, the northernmost community of New Nazi, of which many of you may know as Northern Labrador. Numbers are the same in English, but I'm still mixing up my pages. 
<coughs> Woo. The Tufts University graduate is the national spokesperson for Inuit in Canada and also serves as vice president of the Inuit Circumpolar Council Canada. As president, he implements the direction set out by the Inuit leadership from four regions, the Inuit Nanangat, the uh, Inuit Vialuit, uh, the settlement region of the Northwest Territories, Nanavut, and Nanavik Nunatsiavut. For 10 years, he lived in Iqaluit and worked as the director of social and cultural development for Nunavut Tangat, Tangat Ik, the organization that represents the rights of Nunavut's Inuit. He devoted his career to working with Inuit representational organizations to improve the well-being of Inuit peoples in Canada. Mr. Obed, I'm pleased to pass the Canadian Pub Podium to you. And that was admirable, David. I really appreciate all the effort in, um, in using Inuktut terms in uh, your introduction. And thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, <clears throat> I'm really pleased to be here today. And um, I'd like to start by thanking those who made that possible. Um, <clears throat> from Cisco to TD Bank... Uh, Canada Goose, uh, Borden Ladner Gervais, Agnico Eagle, the Mental Health Commission of Canada, and all other organizations who have sponsored this event. Uh, Nakomik, thank you so much. I'd like to uh, give my appreciation for, for your willingness to listen to this conversation. Uh, and also, I want to thank everyone for coming and, and being here, and also those people who are online. Uh, it's interesting that the focus in the beginning of this has been on language. And it's not just the languages that we speak, English, French, Inuktut, um, uh, any of the indigenous languages of this country. It is also the language that we describe this country of Canada that needs to change. Um, the idea of, of what comprises Canada the way that we speak about our country and the people within it, uh, those are all evolving concepts. What we've seen in the Black Lives Matter movement, in the Me Too movement, um, and in the Indigenous Reconciliation movement are voices that uh, have been elevated to spaces that traditionally uh, had not occupied the consciousness of the country. And the challenge of these movements and the challenge of Canada as a country as a whole depends upon our willingness to understand each other, to support one another, but to also um, believe that Canada can be better than it is today without having to undermine our faith in the country to do so. Inuit have always talked about being um, first Canadians and Canadians first. That is very different than perhaps First Nations or Métis who have very different relationships with the Crown and with the country. Um, but for Inuit, there has been a patriotism in spite of the challenges that, that we have faced from a colonial government and the imposition of colonial governments over time. Uh, I think this speaks to the pragmatism of, of Inuit in working with each other, especially when you consider where Inuit come from. Um, our homeland is a very challenging place to be uh, and one that we, depends upon goodwill amongst um, members of a community in order to survive. Um, the life and death scenarios that uh, we live in are, are in many ways constant, uh, especially in, in winter or when dealing in a marine environment where the ocean water temperature is one degree, three degrees, even in the middle of a summer. <clears throat> it just, uh, our, the way that we see the world has evolved from the necessity to respect one another 
and to get through things, to be resilient. Um, and I think that gives us a, a platform and a, an open mind um, when we want, when we hear people and in institutions say that they want to work with us to create uh, a better world for our communities and our people and for Canada. So a lot of what I do in my role as president of Inuit Tepreet Kanatomi is tell the story of Inuit to other Canadians, uh, to be a spokesperson, to um, give a perspective that perhaps many other Canadians wouldn't have otherwise had. I also lead with saying that um, we are not a monoculture, and when I speak, I am speaking on behalf of a a governance, uh, an institution uh, that what I say is not just off the top of my head when I talk about Inuit positions, and that our governance model sits beside the governance model that perhaps you are more familiar with, with municipalities, uh, provinces and territories, and the federal government. We have an Inuit governance model that also starts in communities that um, differs across Inuit Nunagat, but essentially is elected representatives of Inuit at regional levels, and then those four leaders of, the, of our four regions sit as the ITK board of directors and instruct me through a resolution. So I'm elected not on my own platform or a party platform. I'm elected to serve the interests of uh, Inuit nationally, and those, those interests are decided upon by the democratically elected leaders of each of our four regions. Um, so that also means in democracy, there's a wide variety of perspective and voice. It's vitally important for Canadians to understand that the Inuk that you might meet um, in your travels in next month or two months from now might have a very poor opinion of me <laughs> and, and might be completely opposed to the things that I might say here today that are Inuit positions. I would say that that is exactly the same type of scenario that you would find in Ottawa, in Toronto, um, in Kitchener, wherever you may find yourself when you're talking about regional, uh, provincial, or national politics. It does not undermine the things that I might say to you. It just proves that we have a democracy and a diverse perspective amongst our population, just like any other society. I think sometimes that we are not afforded that, and that is a construct of, I think, colonial dominance, where it's, uh, the other is described as a, a homogeneous um, uh, and... Uh, and fixed entity. It really stifles the ability for Inuit to be ourselves, even within our own communities. There are challenges for personal expression if your entire worldview is shaped in large part by what you can and can't do because of your ethnicity or because of who you are supposed to be. So personally, that's been a journey for me, is the ability to um, be myself in my role uh, be an Inuk, but also um, to be unapologetically who I am, uh, even if some of those, I mean, parts of it, you know, do Inuit run marathons? Well, I do, so, I, I, you know, it's like, Inuit might like to do things and might not, not like to do things, but there's a whole, if you come from a small community, there is a whole fishbowl approach to what perhaps you should do or shouldn't do. So I just pause on that because I think there are many people here who uh, might not know our community very well. And I think that perspective is a really healthy perspective to take in any of the interactions that you might have uh, with our community. Inuit are one of the three indigenous peoples under section 35 of the Canadian Constitution. Uh, the Constitution recognizes Inuit, Métis, and First Nations. Uh, Inuit live in major cities across um, Canada, but primarily Inuit live within our homeland, Inuit Nunangat. It stretches about 33% of Canada's land mass. It encompasses about 72% of Canada's coastline. It's a massive geopolitical space. And through modern treaties or comprehensive land claim agreements, 
Inuit um, either own or co-manage the entirety of that space and the adjacent waters. So politically, Inuit, although we may be about 65,000, uh, we have an outsized importance when it comes to the governance of this country, the way economies function in our homeland, the way that decisions are made on water, on uh, natural resources, on wildlife, um, that are government decisions, that are not just Inuit decisions. Uh, and it also is imm immensely important in the conversation around sovereignty. What does tie uh, Canada's claim to sovereignty in Inuit Nunangat in the Arctic? It is the recognition that Inuit live in the Arctic and Inuit are Canadians. I think that point has not been made enough in the contemporary sense, even if in the 1950s it was such an important point that the government of Canada relocated Inuit from northern Quebec to the high Arctic um, as human flagpoles uh, to assert sovereignty um, in the time of, of the Cold War and the military ex um, uh, buildup in uh, Inuit Nunagat in the Arctic. So we, uh, we have decided to call our homeland Inuit Nunagat. That's a term that I hope that all of you uh, will adopt if you have not already adopted in the, the specific discussions around uh, Inuit and the Inuit homeland. Uh, the term was described in, by our board members and then voted on by our board for 10 years ago now when Mary Simon was president of ITK. I'm so proud that uh, she is now the governor general of this country and I'm also proud that I get to name drop that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we, we have struggled to find our place within the indigenous conversation and uh, our organization ITK has, was founded in 1971. Um, Canada has such a varied and complex relationship with First Nations, Inuit and Métis. It is nonsensical in many ways. Um, there are very few linear conversations you can have about how our existing rights are upheld, how our constructive arrangements have been implemented, and what the future uh, holds for the relationship between um, Inuit and the Crown, First Nations, and Métis in this country. That means that we have so much work to do, especially with the federal government, in defining our space in figuring out how to work constructively and whether it is legislation or policies or programs uh, or an overarching um, consideration of engagement uh, in the protocol area, we are working with Canada and have worked with Canada, especially um, since 2015, on a reconciliation agenda that perhaps uh, was at the time very naive um, and um, I would say very ambitious and genuine and heartfelt, but at the same time, um, a vast lack of understanding of what is necessary uh, in order to have productive relationships and to fully implement self-determination for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis in this country, and the absolute mess in the legislative policy and legal sense that often we find ourselves in when we are trying to work through constructive uh, solutions for many of our policy areas. Uh, across Canada, but especially in Inuit Nunangat, uh, Inuit face staggering inequities. Canadian Inuit experience the highest rates of food insecurity of any indigenous populace, population in an industrialized nation. Our food insecurity rates are up to 70%. Um, that is a combined moderate and severe food insecurity uh, as per the USDA um, mechanism to measure food insecurity. We also have an overcrowding rate of 52% um, in relation to 9% for the Canadian average. 
So you can see just with food insecurity and with housing, uh, there's just these massive um, inequalities that exist between Southern Canadians and Inuit populations. We also have um, a foundational infrastructure deficit. Um, to think that in Nunavut, a, a jurisdiction that is entirely um, uh, linked to a marine environment or a, uh, there's one community in Baker Lake that is still linked to a marine environment but is on a lake, as the name implies, uh, that there is only one deep sea port and that is being built in a um, there, there, For marine and for air and also for water and sewer, our communities were never fully built in the first place. The, the idea of Canada, as I said in the op opening, has not necessarily reached the, a practical level of implementation in the Arctic. Uh, there are only two roads that lead from the south, uh, or two communities that are linked from the south to Inuit Nunungat communities, and that is in the Western Arctic, uh, in Inuvik, and in Tuktoyaktuk. So of our 51 communities, only two are linked uh, by road, and then uh, there are only five communities that are serviced by a seasonal marine ferry. So that means that the majority of our population either fly in or um, get sea lift um, once or twice a year for all the non-perishable goods and services that are required for communities. You can imagine in the time of COVID uh, where immediately society shifted in the South um, to online learning, um, also to working from home, uh, to isolating when sick, to having access to uh, testing. I know that testing was not <laughs> always available. But for us, just imagine that there aren't testing facilities in our homeland and that any of the COVID tests that uh, community members took would have to go to plane to another jurisdiction and then uh, to wait in a queue based on a service agreement between that other jurisdiction and the uh, jurisdiction in which that came from. So we're waiting sometimes between a week and two weeks for results on, on COVID testing. This also applies to uh, areas such as tuberculosis. Um, COVID response depended upon uh, the ability to, to respond in a, in a quick manner. And when um, people in the South didn't have that quick response, it was fascinating to hear about the public uprising and the public uh, discord from governments not being able to provide basic services to constituents. Uh, in Inuit Nunangat, this is our general reality for the majority of our healthcare system. There are only a few hospitals across our 51 communities. The rest are served by health centers, which can provide a number of different um, very basic services but are not serviced by doctors. So any care requiring um, a doctor, people have to be airlifted out of communities and into either regional centers or southern centers in places like Edmonton, Winnipeg, Ottawa, uh, and Montreal. It's in this context uh, of inequity and also challenges in basic service delivery that we have ad advocated for policy solutions with the federal government uh, to reframe the way that government programs are designed and also to work on our priority areas such as housing, homelessness, um, food insecurity, uh, broad considerations for community development and economic development. Uh, we've worked constructively with the Government of Canada through the Inuit Crown Partnership Committee since 2017. Um, it was a declaration that was signed in 2017 that basically created a venue for us to work together on things that were, were of major importance to Inuit and the Government of Canada. The Prime Minister um, chairs the Inuit Crown Partnership Committee on the Government of Canada side, and I chair the, the um, ICPC on the Inuit side. So three times a year we get together and once, it, once with the Prime Minister and twice with 
between five and seven cab cabinet ministers and Inuit leadership. We set work plans, we create um, priority areas, and then we reflect on our progress to date um, as the years go by. One of the areas that we decided to work on was the creation of an Inuit Nunangat policy. Um, a policy for Inuit Nunangat uh, considerations within the federal family is necessary because of the lack of engagement from many of the federal government's 30 departments when it comes to indigenous issues and when it comes to Inuit specific issues. Often within the federal system, um, the Crown Indigenous Relations and Indigenous Services departments get the lion's share of the um, expectations when it comes to working with indigenous peoples. Uh, so say if you're in Infrastructure Canada or Agri-Food Canada um, or any number of, of departments that aren't explicitly linked to an, um, an indigenous service delivery, <clears throat> often you can just pass any of the indigenous specific concerns over to those two departments. Because Inuit do not fall under the Indian Act, uh, and because we work primarily with public governments in our jurisdictions and through relationships with the Crown and our, our comprehensive land claim agreements, often programs and services uh, that are designed to be inclusive for Inuit had almost no ability to be inclusive. There were there are barriers both on the knowledge level and also then in the program design level that, uh, that don't allow for Inuit to take advantage of many of the different um, programs and services that other Canadians and other Canadian jurisdictions um, implicitly could benefit from. This is largely because of the, uh, the strange relationship that each of the Indigenous peoples have with Canada and with provinces and territories. Uh, provinces and territories would often get funding that would be in, that would be meant to also include Inuit, um, but then it then decided to put on additional parameters, perhaps, or to reallocate funds in different ways, or to provide services in a way that weren't consistent with what Inuit leadership and Inuit ourselves uh, thought would be best practice. So the idea that we could create a, a policy that would then direct any single government department on how to respond to an opportunity, whether it was creation of legislation, the creation of policy, the creation of programs, um, with an Inuit-specific lens to, uh, to the, each initiative, would transform the way in which government functions. It would open up doors that have previously not been open for Inuit participation uh, within government services, as Inuit are citizens of this country and parts of public governments, uh, in addition to having um, the right to self-determination and various levels of um, self-determination in the way that we provide services to Inuit. I'll give housing as, a, as an example. Um, there have been uh, federal allocations to housing over the last six years that have been uh, sorely needed. Uh, in this last budget, there, has, there was a $845 million over seven years for Inuit Nunagat housing. Uh, there were previous allocations in other budgets as well. In, in the pre-Inuit um, Nunagat policy era, that money would be allocated to the government of Newfoundland Labrador, or the government of Quebec, the government of the Northwest Territories, the government of Nunavut. And then those governments would apply their particular policy directives and considerations on those funds. Uh, now the relationship is directly between the government of Canada and Inuit land claim leadership. So the four land claim regions are four treaty organizations are the ones that have the right to decide how those funds are spent and the right to decide how they partner, whether with private industry or with governments, to fulfill the obligations under the larger umbrella of the funding opportunity. Um, 
it's, it may seem uh, like a elementary uh, exercise that might even get us to the same end. Perhaps in some Inuit jurisdictions, there isn't a housing construction arm of the land claim organization. And perhaps they will need to partner with the public government jurisdiction. But the, self-determining, the self-determination angle on this can't be understated. The ability for Inuit to decide for ourselves how to best utilize federal resources for the betterment of our communities and meeting the terms and conditions of the government um, opportunity while uh, implementing self-determination and doing what we feel it could be a much better job in uh, implementing uh, uh, services and funds for um, our, our priority areas and those areas that are the most dear to us. This also will spur economic development in our communities. The government of Canada has talked quite a bit about um, uh, elevating procurement standards or um, ensuring that Inuit and Indigenous people largely have a much larger role within federal procurement. This policy also sets out the guidelines for federal consideration of Inuit interests whenever there are economic opportunities. Um, Also, the self-determination approach uh, for any of these pots of funds will then allow for Inuit economic development interests to be considered in a much more complete way than if the interests were solely coming from a federal... uh, federal, territorial, or provincial interests. We, uh, we imagine the Inuit Nunungat policy to be applied um, in many ways that could be transformative today, but over time that it will be transformative just on a, um, a general application level. The federal public service reimagining itself, a new language being spoken, if you will. And so often in the last six or seven years, uh, we as Inuit have passed up perhaps the short-term win of getting um, you know, a specific announcement from a federal government about a number of dollars for a point-in-time activity. And we have uh, purposefully decided to also pursue system change and say that that is just as important and in sometimes is more important than having that big announcement for that big pot of funds for two to four years that might, in the short term, change uh, some of our community's uh, lives and community members, but in the long term, entrenches a status quo that will forever see us needing those big federal announcements. Self-determination is the goal. Um, And the ability for Inuit to be self-determining, to have self-governments, to be uh, more economically independent, to encourage growth within our communities, to see a sea change in the way in which we participate in the economy, the way that our education systems flow, the way that our health care is delivered. All of that depends upon um, our ability to forge a new path and a new relationship with this country and, and in partnership, but also in keeping with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, on the Constitution, on Supreme Court rulings, and also on um, the will of Canadians to elect leaders who are going to see this through uh, as a reconciliation agenda, but also are going to hold um, this country to account for um, the path that I believe we all want to share together towards shared prosperity. Thank you so much for the uh, ability to talk to you today, Nakomik. Thank you, Kirk. Hello, 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 hello. <clears throat> Don't stop till you get an apple cake working. Um, thank you for those remarks. Um, it's interesting. You, Listening to your remarks, I was getting fired up, uh, thinking the challenges that are facing the, the community that you represent 
are unique in so many ways, but as we tell Canada's story in full, there's a, there's a familiar tension, frustration for those of us who have experience in public policy around how decisions are made and how they benefit uh, the people who they should benefit. So um, thank you for continuing to educate so many of us in this journey uh, towards uh, building a better country. Um, with that said, one of the questions we have from the audience, which I think is a nice way to start, uh, given the, re the, the reality of the world we're in today, what's making you hopeful <laughs> for, the, for the future? Well, I guess uh, it starts with rooms like this, where the fact that, um, that I would be um, somebody that people would want to hear from, that the Inuit perspective would be um, something that would be of interest to a larger community, that is relatively new. And so I've, I've seen and witnessed, even in the last six, seven years, Canada reimagining itself and also being more inclusive to all Indigenous peoples. And uh, that gets me incredibly hopeful about uh, what we're able to achieve, achieve together. And the, also that, that things can change. Mm -hmm. like that... Um, when you work on policy or you work on legislation, often the, there is this kind of black hole that it goes into where you're not a community leader. You're not seeing somebody's life change because you provided a service. You're imagining um, interventions happening in a myriad of different ways that you don't have anything to do with. Mm -hmm. uh, but to see uh, um, things change from a... Um, political level uh, to hear that reconciliation is now a part of the general conversation. It isn't just one party or one particular leader. Those things make me hopeful. Um, I think also just the general goodwill that we have towards one another in these spaces, um, that goes a long way as well. Yeah, well, that's insightful. For those of you who have not worked in government or influenced in government, the black hole Natan's referring to is called a budget consultation. Um, I encourage all of you to, to try that out. Um, I, I, this morning, I, truthfully, Danny's here from Canada Goose. I know their company's done a lot of work in the north and, and, and around reconciliation. Sustainability is sort of a word we use in corporate Canada. I was on a call this morning with our CEO, uh, with some uh, um, Indigenous leaders around how we can show up better, listen uh, as, we, as we move forward. Um, uh, an elder in Alberta said to me once, um, I went in with a presentation. I had Gantt charts and decks and slides, and I was, I was board ready, as we like to say. And she reminded me that I was colonizing the effort, that I needed to just stop. Uh, I hear that a lot sometimes. Um, what advice do you have for so many of us in the room who want to uh, make a contribution uh, to economic empowerment, to the self-determination you're talking about, as we consider the right step forward? Mm -hmm. First off, uh, you know, don't try to be a hero, right? I, please don't try to save others. I mean, the, the respect is really the heart of the relationship um, to be productive. And it's the respect of meeting people and communities, the place where they are. And sometimes it means that you have to completely reorient what success looks like from your perspective or your um, corporation's perspective. Uh, what, it, it may not mean that uh, you have to completely lose sight of your goals as an organization, profit margins, the, the larger initiative. It just means that um, what you, you, if you imagine that you might have 10 young Inuit who are gonna be mentored into senior roles in three years, um, and that you're going to go find them tomorrow. And if you don't find them, then you just give up and say, well, I, I tried, but I, I couldn't. Maybe the solution in scenarios like that is that uh, say, what is possible? If what I imagined isn't possible, what, what can I do with the community? Um, and can that fit within the corporate culture and environment and within the broad expectations of, of um, the relationship? That, to me, um, creates so many uh, positive opportunities. And that other way um, often creates scenarios where you demand for communities to give you course correction. 
in, in confrontational ways maybe, uh, in ways that, that they stress out about too. So on the other side, uh, people don't want to be disrespectful. People don't want to come in and tell you that everything you have to say is wrong. Mm -hmm. But if you come in and you don't give that space for an open conversation about what's possible, then that inevitably is what happens. In 2016, you um, issued a report called Inuit Priorities for Canada's Climate Strategy. Um, this past, I think, 12 months, we've seen a real inflection point, acceleration around the discussion as it concerns to carbon neutrality, uh, Canada's role in achieving net zero. As that discussion accelerates, given your lived experience, given the community you represent and the real and present impacts that climate change is having uh, to, to the community, uh, what are your thoughts? Are we doing enough? Is carbon neutrality enough? How do, we, how do we accelerate efforts in that space? We aren't doing enough. Uh, I'm, I think that's, I don't think I have to be on one side of this or the other just to say objectively, if our goal is net zero, we aren't doing enough today. Um, you know, I've heard a lot about competitiveness and uh, that is a reason for not doing more also think that electability of public officials is, is, is another reason why uh, um, there isn't a more ambitious agenda. Uh, and for, for us, seeing our environment um, categorically change, mm -hmm. and not just over my lifetime, but over the last 10 to 15 years. Like, it, we are seeing unprecedented uh, extreme weather events. We are seeing coastal erosion. Uh, our sea ice cover is uh, drastically less than it was even 20 years ago. Um, we are concerned about the foundation of the Arctic ecosystem. Uh, we're seeing thawing permafrost and, and all the terrible effects that that has. And so we are in some cases, whether we like it or not, the canaries in the coal mine um, for just telling the story of the lived experience of climate change, especially drastic climate change effects. Uh, on, on the flip side, we aren't powerful enough to, uh, to change the Canadian government's or industry's um, course today. But uh, we just have to continue to have that conversation um, and just be as stark as possible without being um, disrespectful about the necessity to do more in relation to climate action. Nathan, um, we are supposed to be wrapping right now, but speaking of power and privilege, <clears throat> I'm the president. Um, so I'm going to extend the session by a few minutes because I think we have some important questions that we want to get through and ask for your grace in, in extending the session a little bit. If you have to leave, I'd ask you to do that thoughtfully, but I'm going to get through the next few questions if that's okay with the room. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, connect connectivity um, as a priority uh, for ITK, whether that's optic fiber connectivity, information connectivity, you talked about transportation uh, as, a, as a, I won't call it a challenge because you didn't use that word, but as a unique dynamic of, of, of the region. Uh, what do the rest of us need to know about that, uh, whether it's a priority and how we might raise the volume on, on that issue? Yeah, with COVID, uh, again, working from home, uh, um, all of the Zoom meetings that you've all been on, the Teams meetings, they require a certain level of connectivity, um, a certain level of network performance. And for Inuit Nunagat, we still don't have that. Uh, we don't have basic connectivity. Ever since connectivity became a major consideration for government policy, Inuit regions um, have been behind perhaps in three to four generations of technology. So uh, we still, struggle for basic connectivity, uh, let alone the type of connectivity that would allow for um, online learning, uh, for um, medical care to happen remotely, and also for businesses. Uh, if Between uh, lack of connectivity and the extraordinarily high prices for shipping, um, there's almost no chance for small businesses to operate in the same way that small businesses operate in the South. Uh, I, th I think for also just for basic connectivity, uh, as, a, as it has become more of a, of a quasi right of, you know, just the expectation of Canadians is that you are able 
um, to, to connect. Uh, we still are struggling for that. And uh, even in a place like Akali, it's bandwidth dependent upon weather and on, on usage. Mm. So if you have a number of people using the system at a certain time, your internet is going to be much slower. Or if the storm comes in, you might have uh, lack of access to the satellite. I mean, that's, these are just things that I don't think many other Canadians ever have to consider. Uh, so connectivity is so important for business, for uh, the running of the government, for our education system, for our healthcare system. Um, and there are solutions that are possible. Uh, um, ITK doesn't have a, um, a particular um, um, project in mind, although we are supportive of our Inuit regions who are trying to partner and push connectivity projects through. I think of um, you know, the hydro fiber link in the Kivalik in the central Arctic, uh, and that project has been discussed for some time now, but that would not only provide uh, greener energy into a number of our communities, but also would provide uh, connectivity in a way that doesn't exist now. And uh, it would be great if there was more urgency in uh, government action on some of these. I have two more questions for you from the audience. <clears throat> the first is what role, you mentioned education, what role does that play in self-determination? Uh, uh, we, we talk about uh, an Inuit self-determination perspective and that Inuit communities and Inuit ourselves have certain skill levels that perhaps aren't um, uh, on a resume but exist because of life experience or because of the skills that the knowledge that we have from our families and from our elders. But even so, uh, that doesn't mean that it always will exist. And we are still at a crisis point where we need to create an education system that um, brings the best of our Inuit knowledge and um, uh, Canadian knowledge within the pedagogy of education together to ensure that our students have the best possible uh, success, not only in Inuit Nunagat, but also in Canada. We have a real struggle in ensuring that we have enough teachers. Um, we have uh, low um, graduation rates. We have low access to post-secondary. And that will not create the type of um, uh, workforce that will allow for the implementation of self-determination. So we do have a massive challenge. And uh, uh, it is up to us uh, as leaders to figure out how to provide better education and better educational environments. But I think it's also up to um, public governments and, and systems to be able to respond to this new space that we're in that's trying to respect Inuit self-determination at the same time as, um, as a more status quo educational experience for students. Much of the uh, corporate <clears throat> uh, conversation around a role that corporations can play in respecting reconciliation and, and self-determination is around economic um, empowerment. Um, the, the northern regions in the country um, are resource rich in, in, in many respects. This question is related to um, the expansion of mining in the north uh, and in territories that, that, that ITK uh, represents. What advice do you have for mining companies as they think about expansion and some of the roadblocks, hurdles, challenges uh, that, that they may face in, in partnering uh, with ITK or communities in the region? Yeah, our land claim agreements have specific provisions in them around resource development. And in each of the jurisdictions, uh, there are impact benefit agreements, but there are also then uh, different tranches of, of, of um, lands. So there could be Inuit-owned lands, or there could be just settlement area lands. And depending upon where potential projects um, are located, there may be the government and industry may have different obligations to, to Inuit. The biggest challenge has been um, the engagement with communities that most adjacent, uh, the ability to implement impact benefit agreements, um, the ability for all parties to uh, make the most of the opportunity. Uh, so uh, there are some universal uh, challenges. 
where you have where there will always be opposition to um, particular projects. There will always there will always be a, a varying degree of perspective, um, and so if Inuit are inclined to sign an impact benefit agreement to um, allow for for access of corporation corporate interest in the natural resource sector, there still are so many things that have to happen for it to go right. Uh, and uh, the challenge has been often uh, with mergers or with complete change of control. Sometimes there is that lost link from the person who came to the community and shook you know, the hand of the local leaders to now the person who is implementing the impact benefit agreement. Um, and having the continuity uh, there and having the relationship with community is something that is ongoing and not something that is point in time. Uh, but at the heart of it, uh, for our self-determination to work best, uh, our land claim agreements are structured in such a way that uh, natural resource extraction is a part of the funding of the implementation of our self-governments, of uh, the implementation of um, the things that we want most for our society. So Inuit are not in a place to just say categorically we don't want natural resource extraction. We're in a very privileged place in many cases in relation to First Nations and Métis in this country where we can work through our institutions um, to be able to make constructive decisions. But the, the, the partnership still is a thing at the heart of it that um, is not point in time. It's not something you can ever walk away from as, as an industry leader. Relationships matter. Yes. Nathan, thank you for joining us today and thank you for being here at the Canadian Club. On behalf, ooh, ooh. on behalf of the club, uh, thank you for sharing your vision on Inuit self-determination and prosperity with us today. The desire for socioeconomic, health equity, education equity are goals that we should all work towards in our efforts towards truth and reconciliation and building a better Canada. Uh, I speak on behalf of the club when I say we admire your resolve, your focus, and your resilience as you pursue these goals on behalf of ITK. So thank you. Before we close today's event, I want to again thank our sponsors, TD, BLG, and, uh, and Eco Eagle. Did I say that right? I did, wow, yes, good. Um, let me also take a moment to invite you to our final events of the season. On Wednesday, June 8th, we host an impressive virtual panel of guest speakers who will discuss the future of conservatism in Canada. We hope you can join us. I'm away that day. Um, truly, I am away that day, but we have another host. Do a great job. Um, and on the evening of June 22nd, I'm thrilled to be hosting our annual Pride celebration uh, with uh, guest uh, Katie Dexhead from RBC and Andrew uh, Kriegler from IROC. We're going to sit down and have a discussion on how business, politics, and civil society can prioritize 2SLGBTQ acceptance uh, as we move to the agenda around queer rights and why it matters even more now. Uh, I'm proud to be the third the third openly queer president of the club in its 125 year history. Uh, so let's keep building forward. And on June 23rd, we host our final event of the season with John Graham, CEO of CC CPP Investments. They changed that name, Willa. It used to be CCPIV, right? Yeah. Changed it. Um, and he's gonna join us to talk about uh, how he's delivering on an agenda to grow our $539 billion fund in the face of rising inflation, market volatility, and changing climate. Let me conclude by thanking our AVs partners, Van Valkenburg Communications and LiveMeetings.ca for making it possible for us to gather here physically as well as virtually. Thank you for being with us in person or online, and thank you for support of the club. Good afternoon. Thank you.